Thank you, everyone, um, and uh, appreciate everyone's um, extended patience today as our session run runs long. It's 4.47. Um, I'd like to welcome and thank our public comment speakers for addressing the committee today. All the speakers today submitted a request in advance of the meeting, and the final list of public commenters was determined via a lottery. For our speakers today, we have a limited public comment period, and in order to make it through all the um, listed speakers, it's extremely important each speaker limits his, her, or their remarks to three minutes. Uh, we will be displaying a timer on the screen so you know how much time you have left. Um, as a reminder, our committee appreciates the diverse viewpoints that are brought to the committee that are respectful in nature and focused on the issues rather than comments directed at individuals. Thank you again to our speakers, and we look forward to your comments. Um, one moment while I pull up my list. Just got it. Okay, thank you. Uh, first is Ms. Sarah Berry. Hello, can you hear me? We can, please go ahead. Hello, my name is Sarah Berry. I am an independent pro-vaccine advocate, and I thank the ACIP members not only for the opportunity to speak today, but also for continuing to have these critical discussions. I would also like to thank ACIP, ACIP specifically for their vote to recommend the COVID-19 vaccine for children. My main goal as a pro-vaccine advocate has been to educate anybody who will give me their time about the extensive abuse of autistic children at the hands of the anti-vaccine community. And I do this because I truly believe that vaccine hesitancy will not go away until as many people as possible become aware of the fact. If you don't believe me, then you should at least believe the anti-vaxxers who are afraid of me and my message. As I shared last time I gave public comment, my advocacy has resulted in online harassment from extremists and also what I worry were intentional efforts to intimidate me at my home in the form of multiple protests across the street from where I live. I've also shared how I worked with Angie Nassar from Al Jazeera Plus to expose anti-vax lobbyists who wanted to and tried to censor my testimony at the Ohio State House. And you can find the video evidence of that on the Al Jazeera Plus YouTube channel. I truly believe that the only reason anti-vaxxers might try to harass and censor me is because they know that what I say is true and they are terrified of me. When I did my first research on vaccine controversies, I started by reading anti-vaccine articles that were being propped up as evidence that vaccines could cause harm. An anti-vax family member started me on my journey by sending me a PDF of study summaries created by the anti-vax group Focus for Health, which is run by Brian Hooker. The second study, the second study on that PDF was done by Mark Geyer. And I believe, as I've shared before, it took me one five second Google search to discover that he lost his medical license for chemically castrating autistic children. Think of all the times anti-vaxxers accused ACIP of unethical behavior, even to the point of implying that you deserve to go on trial. Where is that same energy for Mark Geyer and others like him? Geyer literally experimented on autistic children without telling parents the full risks. But Robert F. Kennedy Jr. complained that corrupt medical professionals have systematically disgraced and silenced him. In fact, if you go on the anti-vax nonprofit website run by Robert F. Kennedy Jr., you will find dozens upon dozens upon dozens of examples of Mark Geyer's work being propped up as legitimate evidence of vaccine harm. The vaccine hesitancy conversation should be about so much more than just vaccines. To truly win against the misinformation, you have to expose the ridiculous double standards that allow charlatans like Mark Geyer to profit off of desperate anti-vax families. It was not difficult for somebody as average as myself to research this information. And as much as I disagree with them, the anti-vaccine community deserves to know that the leaders they look up to have utterly betrayed them. I again thank the ICIP for continuing to have these important conversations. And if anybody listening has any questions, you can find me on Twitter at 42 Believer. Thank, thank you. Thank you for your comment. Uh, your time has expired. Uh, we will move on to the next uh, speaker, uh, Ms. Mrs. Colleen Thomas. Hi, can you hear me? Uh, we can. Please go ahead. My name is Colleen Thomas. I work with Hoosiers Vaccinate, a volunteer led vaccine advocacy group in Indiana. I became a vaccine advocate because my nine-year-old son has a primary immunodeficiency, meaning he was born missing part of his immune system. He also has severe asthma. Since birth, he has suffered from recurrent severe respiratory infections, often taking weeks to recover from multiple rounds of antibiotics, sometimes oral steroids. He depends on herd immunity to avoid exposure to preventable diseases in our community. 
the more people around him that are vaccinated, the less likely he is to encounter a severe disease that he would struggle to fight off. Having a child with this condition was always a challenge, but the past 20 months living through a global pandemic has been the biggest challenge we've ever faced. Our family has isolated since March, 2020. My son has not been in school. We have missed all holidays. He rarely plays with friends. His education has suffered. The social isolation had a major impact on my son's emotional and mental health. Finally, a vaccine is available and it will allow him to return to school, play sports, and be with friends and family. I'm speaking today to thank you, the ACIP members who have invested time in reviewing the vaccine studies and recommending this pediatric vaccine. You had an integral part in ending this nightmare for our family. In truth, my son doesn't always mount an immune response to all vaccines. He may not develop as many antibodies as a healthy child once he gets this vaccine. He'll probably wear a mask in school and out in public longer than his peers, but even so, his life is about to improve greatly. I understand there are vaccine hesitant parents and they get a lot of press and I have empathy for all parents through this whole ordeal, but I'm all too keenly aware of risk versus benefit analysis when it comes to my little boy's health. And this vaccine for us is a no brainer. As I speak, my son is at the health department with his dad. Actually, he's home now because this went long but he got his first dose of COVID today. I took the first available appointment and it happened to be right now. <laughs> I didn't go so I could stay here and make this comment, but I'll for sure be at his second appointment. There are over 300 types of primary immunodeficiencies and they affect thousands of children in the US, many of whom can safely receive the vaccine and who no doubt have parents who have been anxiously waiting for this vaccine, just as we have been. Vaccinations have protected children from severe disease for decades and are safe and effective. They protect the most vulnerable in our society. My final comment is I would like to see a better system in place for verifying vaccination status as the CDC COVID cards have been all too easy for people to falsify. Not all states have electronic verification systems. The U.S. needs a central verification database that's more tamper-proof going forward. I thank you for your time, for allowing my comments today, and especially for the work you do. Thank you for your comment. Next is Susie Olson Corgan. Hello, my name is Susie Olson Corgan. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My comments are in direct response to your recommendation to add the Pfizer BioNTech COVID 19 biological product to the adolescent immunization schedule for 5 to 11 year olds. During the Food and Drug Administration's Vaccine and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee meeting last week, Pfizer was asked several questions regarding safety and potential adverse events in children receiving their COVID-19 jabs. Answers included the following. We do not know. We don't have that data. We will find out as more children receive them. Hearing we do not know should have been the end of this discussion. Yet VerbPAC went ahead and recommended the EUA application to be approved and the FDA obliged. With answers like we do not know, how could you, ASIP, our public health regulatory agency, in good conscience, while maintaining your duty to protect the public, add this product to the recommended adolescent schedule. Did you listen to this meeting? Did you ask questions? Did you read all the reports and presentations? Did you do your due diligence before your vote took place yesterday? During these meetings, once again, it was made clear that our children are the safety study. There is nothing, there is nothing definitive showing that children giving them this jab is justified when looking at the risk benefit of adverse events from the jab versus potential risk of natural infection. There's no definitive data showing that children receiving the COVID-19 jab will protect adults. And since when have we as adults been okay with sacrificing our kids and their health to potentially protect us? When did this become a data point we even considered? There is nothing definitive showing that these biological products will stop transmission, hospitalizations, or deaths in adolescents. However, myocarditis, pericarditis, Bell's palsy, death, all adolescent adverse events that have been reported to the vaccine adverse event reporting system after having received a COVID-19 jab. Are these AEs not of concern to you? They surely are to me. As for me and the thousands of parents I've spoken to across the country, we will not give our children any version of the COVID-19 jab, no matter how often you participate in, create, or fund social media campaigns trying to convince us otherwise. No matter how many billions of dollars you put into public relation campaigns, we will not give our children this experimental product. No matter how many times you, the ACIP, the FDA, public health officials, politicians, or celebrities tell us that we have to, 
for the greater good. Uh, thank you. My for child is my responsibility and mine alone. I will not give my child this jab despite how many product services, access to restaurants, bars, or events we are unjustifiably barred from. There's absolutely nothing you can do to convince me that giving this to my child is worth the risk. It is all risk. For any parents listening to this meeting, I beg you, please do your own research. Read the report submitted to the vaccine manufacturers by the vaccine manufacturers to the FDA for EUA. Make sure that you know the actual risk versus benefit. Public health won't tell you, and after listening to these regulatory agency meetings, I will tell you Thank that you they for do your not comment. care. Your time has expired. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to the next public comment speaker, Michaela Jackson. Good afternoon. My name is Michaela Jackson, and I am the Prevention Policy Manager for the Hepatitis B Foundation. During the September discussion on a recommendation for universal adult hepatitis B vaccination, committee members questioned the true need for such a recommendation. For the past two years, we have submitted comments that with statistics and data on the need for all adults to be vaccinated. Today, we would like to answer the question posed during the September meeting with the responses of brave individuals who shared their moving stories with us. So why do we need universal Hep B vaccination for all adults? We need universal Hep B vaccination for the daughter who did not know that she should have been vaccinated. Her mother passed away from hepatitis B related liver cancer, and now she lives in fear that she might develop it too. We need this recommendation for the mother who lost her son to Solomon hepatitis B after he was accidentally pricked by a needle in medical school. Hepatitis B vaccination for adults was not common when he was exposed. Just this year, a 56 year old woman became infected by Hep B and she does not know how she was exposed. The woman says, I want everyone to be vaccinated for hepatitis B. I didn't believe I was at risk. A universal recommendation is needed for the niece who wrote about losing her aunt to liver cancer and the emotional toll it took on her family. She asked ACIP to pass a recommendation to help inform the public about the vaccines they need and to prevent others from going through the pain that her family felt. We need universal vaccination for the man who became an advocate after learning he had a hepatitis C and hepatitis D co-infection. He now wants everyone to know that this vaccine can prevent two serious liver infections. Another man pays $2,700 a month for chronic hepatitis B treatment. Many people are unaware that this vaccine exists. I have been dealing with Hep B for 16 years and I was never told about the vaccine, he says. If I would have known about it, I would have gotten it without question. We need the universal recommendation for primary care providers who find it burdensome to ask about 18 different risk factors and for people who want to be vaccinated but are afraid to discuss the true risk with their doctor. And finally, we need it for the dozens of people who commented, I wish I knew about the vaccine before I contracted Hep B. Simply put, the public health community believes, as one person wrote, that an anti-cancer vaccine should be universally available. The stories told today demonstrate the clear lack of awareness and education from both a patient and provider perspective, in addition to highlighting the need for an inclusive recommendation. They also represent the numerous lives that have been irrevocably changed by a failure to close well-known gaps in access to hepatitis B vaccination. Sadly, stories like the ones told today are, not, are common, but they do not have to be. The recommendations by ACIP have real-life implications that reach every single American. It is time to eliminate burdensome, stigmatizing, risk-based guidelines and replace them with effective policies that will help eliminate viral hepatitis. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for your comment. Uh, our last public speaker for the session is Ms. Beatrice Zovich. Good afternoon. My name is Beatrice Sovich, and I am a public health prog program coordinator for the Hepatitis B Foundation. While we wait in great anticipation of the vote for universal adult hepatitis B vaccination this afternoon, we must express disappointment with the committee's decision to include to exclude adults six, age 60 and older in the proposed recommendation. No one should be subjected to the stress and mental anguish of being diagnosed with a preventable illness, and prevention is always more cost effective than treatment. As a patient advocacy organization, we receive thousands of calls annually from people who have questions or concerns about hepatitis B, and each year, nearly 10% of calls are from people age 60 and older. We've also received countless inquiries from people age 60 and older who have tried to get vaccinated, but were denied by their primary care providers. Many insurance programs provide coverage for ASIP recommended vaccines, but will only cover those who are at high risk for infection. We cannot claim that everyone has equal access when people are regularly refused the vaccine because of the current guidelines. The reality is that risk-based guidelines for any adult ignore the role of the social determinants of health. 
Hep B and its risk factors are heavily stigmatized, especially among immigrants who already face healthcare challenges, including those relating to language and culture. As many as 60% of individuals living with hepatitis B in the United States were born in a different country. The stigma and discrimination faced by those living with Hep B in many parts of the world is tremendous. Misperceptions that the disease primarily affects those who engage in certain behaviors run rampant, and it is not uncommon for people to face barriers to obtaining education and employment. Given prevailing cultural attitudes, as well as limited English proficiency, and the discomfort and confusion that surround navigation of the healthcare system in the United States, the burden of requesting Hep B vaccination needs to be removed from vulnerable communities. Additionally, the responsibility of questioning each patient about their country of origin in order to determine whether or not they should receive a vaccine, information that is not generally collected by most physicians in standard health surveys, should not be placed on busy physicians either. By making this recommendation universal and creating a standing order for it, all confusion and shame will be removed from the equation and adults will be able to receive this important vaccine in a way that is as routine as the offering of a flu shot or a blood test for cholesterol. The Hep B vaccine prevents not only hepatitis B, but also hepatitis delta, the most severe form of viral hepatitis that can only occur in people living with Hep B. With no treatments approved in the U.S., people who contract this dangerous co-infection have a nearly 70% chance of developing significant liver damage, including liver cancer. One couple who shared their story with us talked about the heartbreaking ordeal they endured when doctors did not conduct proper monitoring of the husband's infection and did not test for hepatitis delta until significant liver damage and cancer had developed. No one should have to invest years of their life and countless emotional and financial resources for a vaccine preventable illness. Vaccinating all adults is a very safe and highly effective way to move swiftly toward the goal of happy elimination in as equitable as fashion as possible. Thank you for your thank comment. Thank you for your time. Your time has expired. Thank you very much. Um, I want to thank all of our public comment speakers for today. Um, and uh, I'm going to ask, actually, that we now move on to the voting section of the meeting. Um, if we could please put up the first vote, which is the hepatitis B vote. Um, thank you. Uh, so. I will just ask if there's any additional questions or major issues the committee would like to discuss before the vote. I will also actually preface this by saying, at the end of the nine votes we have in front of us, uh, you are, uh, I invite you to make any additional comments um, you would like to make uh, to explain your vote. Um, but we are going to go through all nine votes. Uh, so I'm going to ask first if you have any additional questions or issues you feel are critical for us to discuss prior to the vote. Um, so I'm going to go back to my... Oh, and I forgot, I need video. Oh, boy. Sorry, everybody should please put on your video. Thank you. OK, terrific. Thank you, everyone. Um, so this was the vote language that was um, put forward as an amendment that had passed. Uh, the ACIP recommends the following groups should receive hepatitis B vaccines, adults 19 through 59 years, adults 60 years and older with risk factors for hepatitis B infection. And the ACIP recommends the following groups may receive hepatitis B vaccines, adults 60 and older, without known risk factors for hepatitis B infection. Uh, we are hoping this clarifies the questions that were brought up earlier. Any questions? OK. Um, so for the first of nine votes, I'm going to call on uh, Ms. Lynn Bata. Oh, and as a reminder, please state your name, whether you have any conflict, um, conflicts of interest for this vote, um, and your, uh, whether you say yes, no, or other. Ms. Bata. Ms. Bata, no conflict. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Bell. Bell, no conflict. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Brooks. Oliver Brooks, no conflict. Yes. Dr. Chen. Over Chen, no conflict. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Sineas? Sybil Sineas, no conflict. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Daly? Matt Daly, no conflicts. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Cotton? Neil Cotton, no conflicts. Yes. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead so I don't forget myself this time. Lee, no conflicts. Yes. Um, Dr. Lair? Amy Lair, no conflict, yes. Dr. Long? 
Long, no conflict, yes. Thank you. Uh, Ms. McNally. McNally, no conflict, yes. Thank you. Dr. Paling. Oh, Paling, no conflict, yes. Thank you. Dr. Sanchez. Sanchez, no conflict, yes. Thank you. Dr. Talbot. Talbot, no conflict, yes. Thank you. Dr. Alt. Alt, no conflicts, yes. Thank you. And so this uh, hepatitis B vote uh, passes 15 yeses, zero noes, um, and we can move on to the next vote, the immunization schedule vote. Um, uh, so just uh, to clarify, we have just uh, tried to make the wording consistent across the vote, so we added the ACIP approves the recommended child and adolescent immunization schedule United States 2022 and the recommended adult immunization schedule United States 2022. Any um, clarifications or uh, burning issues that need to be raised before this vote? Um, Dr. Wharton has one uh, uh, comment she'd just like to add to clarify a question from earlier. Uh, so there had been a question about some uh, ACIP procedural language that had been included in the schedules, and um, that, that has been removed uh, in the revision. And uh, other comments from the committee have been incorporated, and um, a, re a revised schedule uh, has been developed. Thank you, Dr. Warden. Um, we're going to start this uh, vote with Dr. Oliver Brooks. Oliver Brooks, no conflicts, yes. Thank you. Going backwards, just to warn you, Dr. Bell. Bell, no conflicts, yes. Thank you. Ms. Bata? Bata, no conflicts, yes. Thank you. Dr. Alt? Alt, no conflicts, yes. Thank you. Dr. Talbot? Talbot, no conflicts, yes. Thank you. Dr. Sanchez? Um, Sanchez, no conflict, yes. Thank you. Dr. Paling. Paling, no conflict, yes. Thank you. Ms. McNally. McNally, no conflict, yes. Thank you. Dr. Long. Long, no conflict, yes. Thank you. Dr. Lair. Lair, no conflict, yes. Thank you. Uh, Lee, no conflicts, yes. Dr. Cotton. Camille Cotton, no conflicts, yes. Thank you. Dr. Daly. Uh, Daly, no conflicts, yes. Thank you. Dr. Sineas. Sineas, no conflicts, yes. Thank you. And Dr. Chen. Chen, no conflicts, yes. Thank you. So this immunization schedule vote passes 15 yeses, zero noes. Thank you, everybody. And we will move on to the next vote. Sorry, I'm looking at which. Um, these are the, uh, this is the orthopox virus team. Um, and there are five votes on the table. Uh, since there are five votes all related to the same topic, what I will ask, well, first, are there any burning questions or issues people have about vote number one? Or any of the votes, I should say. Okay, I don't see any hands raised, so I'm going to actually ask that um, if you can just state your conflicts with the first vote for anything related to orthopox virus vaccines. Um, you do not need to restate it for votes two, three, four, and five. We will just assume that the uh, conflict that you state or don't uh, or do not have will be uh, held throughout the five votes. Okay, so next uh, we have, uh, we'll start with Dr. Chen for vote number one for orthopox. Chen, no conflict, yes. Thank you. Dr. Sineas? Sineas, no conflict, yes. Thank you. Dr. Daly? Daly, no conflicts, yes. Thank you. Dr. Cotton? Cotton, no conflict, yes. Lee, no conflicts, yes. Dr. Lair. Lair, no conflicts, yes. Dr. Long. 
long, no conflict, any orthopox virus. Yes. Thank you. Ms. McNally. McNally, no conflict. Yes. Dr. Paling. Paling, no conflict. Yes. Dr. Sanchez. Sanchez, no conflict. Yes. Dr. Talbot. Talbot, no conflict. Yes. Dr. Alt. Alt, no conflicts, yes. Ms. Bata. Bata, no conflicts, yes. Yeah. Dr. Bell. Bell, no conflicts, yes. Yeah. Dr. Brooks. Oliver Brooks, no conflicts on any orthopox virus vote, yes. Yeah. Thank you. And going forward for votes two through five, we will assume the conflicts uh, statement remains the same. So we will move on. Oh, sorry, I should have sta stated. Uh, orthopox vo vote number one passes, 15 yeses, zero noes. We'll move on to vote number two, which has not changed in wording, so I will not read it out loud. Uh, and we will move on to, we'll start with Dr. Sineas. You can just say your name and, and your vote. Sineas, yes. Dr. Chen. Chen, yes. Dr. Brooks. Brooks, yes. Dr. Bell. Bell, yes. Ms. Bata. Bata, yes. Dr. Alt. Alt, yes. Uh, Dr. Talbot. Talbot, yes. Dr. Sanchez. Sanchez, yes. Dr. Paling. Paling, yes. Ms. McNally. McNally, yes. Dr. Long. Long, yes. Dr. Lair. Lair, yes. Lee, yes. Dr. Cotton. Cotton, yes. Dr. Daly. Daly, yes. Thank you. Vote number two passes with 15 yeses and zero noes. We'll move on to orthopox virus vote number three. I'll just give you a moment to read that one more time to remind you. Okay. Um, we will start with vote number three with, um, I think Dr. Daly's up on my list. Dr. Daly. Daly, yes. Dr. Cotton? Cotton, yes. Uh, Lee, yes. Dr. Lair? Lair, yes. Dr. Long? Long, yes. Ms. McNally? McNally, yes. Dr. Paling? Paling, yes. Dr. Sanchez? Sanchez, yes. Dr. Talbot. Talbot, yes. Dr. Alt. Alt, yes. Ms. Bata. Bata, yes. Dr. Bell. Bell, yes. Dr. Brooks. Uh, Brooks, yes. Dr. Chen. Chen, yes. Dr. Sineas. Yes. yes. Thank you. And vote number three passes with 15 yeses, zero noes. Um, so thank you. We'll move on to orthopox virus vote number four. I'll give you a moment to read it. I just need to remind myself as well. Uh, and the wording here uh, did get inserted. Um, at least every 10 years after the primary Genio series. So thank you for that edit. Um, we will move to uh, vote number four, and I will um, start with Dr. Cotton. Cotton, yes. Dr. Daly. Daly, yes. Dr. Sineas. Sineas, yes. Dr. Chen. Chen, yes. Dr. Brooks. Brooks, 
Yes. Dr. Bell. Bell, yes. Dr. Bata, Ms. Bata. Bata, yes. Dr. Alt. Alt, yes. Dr. Talbot. Talbot, yes. Dr. Sanchez. Sanchez, yes. Dr. Paling. Paling, yes. Ms. McNally. McNally, yes. Dr. Long. Long, yes. Dr. Lair. Lair, yes. And Lee, yes. And vote number four passes 15 yeses, zero noes. And we are really wishing we had electronic voting now. Okay, we'll go to vote number five, orthopox virus vote. Uh, we'll leave that up for a moment just to remind people. Uh, and it looks like, uh, thank you, the wording did get changed slightly. So uh, the statement ends with receive a booster dose of Genios as an alternative to a booster dose of ACAM 2000. Any questions or concerns? Okay, we are going to start with Dr. Lair. Dr. Lair. Lair, yes. Thank you. Lee, yes. Dr. Cotton? Cotton, yes. Dr. Daly? Daly, yes. Dr. Sineas? Sineas, yes. Dr. Chen? Chen, yes. Dr. Brooks? Brooks, yes. Dr. Bell? Bell, yes. Ms. Bata? Bata, yes. Dr. Alt? Alt, yes. Dr. Talbot? Talbot, yes. Dr. Sanchez? Sanchez, yes. Dr. Paling? Paling, yes. Ms. McNally? McNally, yes. Dr. Long? Long, yes. Okay. And vote number five passes with 15 yeses and zero noes. Okay, thank you, everybody. Um, we will move on to the Ebola vaccine vote. Okay. <laughs> um, actually, I, I just want to make sure uh, we're clear on the wording, so I'm just going to actually ask the Ebola team to read the wording on the vote number one, if that's okay. Sure. Um, the ACIP recommends pre-exposure vaccination with the RVSV Delta G Z Zbob GP vaccine is recommended for healthcare personnel involved in the care and transport of suspect or confirmed Ebola virus disease patients at special pathogens treatment centers. Okay, thank you. And um, as a reminder, this time you will uh, be asked to say your name, whether you have any conflicts of interest with this vaccine, and then your vote. Um, so we will start with Dr. Long. Long, no conflict, yes, but you've repeated is recommended in the second line that you're going to want to take out, but it doesn't change the meaning. Thank you so much, Dr. Long. <laughs> we always appreciate your edits. <laughs> um, Dr. Lair. Lair, yeah. Uh, um, Dr. Cotton. Uh, Camille Cotton, no conflicts, yes. Oh, yes, thank you for reminding me. Dr. Lair, do you have any conflicts? Lair, no conflicts, yes. Thank you. Dr. Daly. Daly, no conflicts, yes. Dr. Sineas. Sineas, no conflicts, yes. Dr. Chen. Gilbert Chen, no conflicts, yes. Dr. Brooks. Dr. Brooks, no conflicts, yes. Dr. Bell. Bell, no conflicts, yes. Ms. Bata. Bata, no conflicts, yes. Dr. Alt. Alt, no conflicts, yes. Dr. Talbot. Talbot, no conflict, no. Dr. Sanchez. 
Ventures, no conflict, yes. Dr. Paling. Paling, no conflict, no. Ms. McNally. McNally, no conflict, no. And um, Lee, no conflicts, no. Um, the vote number one passes with, um, I can't do the math, 11 yeses and four noes. Um, and we will move on to vote number two. Um, for vote number two, um, would you go ahead and read that for us, please, <laughs> Dr. Choi? <laughs> yeah, we have the same typo, I believe. Um, ACIP recommends pre-exposure vaccination with the RVSV Delta G Z Bob GP vaccine for laboratorians and support staff at laboratory response network facilities that handle specimens that may contain replication-competent Ebola virus, species Ebola virus in the United States. Thank you. And we will begin uh, this vote with Ms. McNally. McNally, no. Um, and we will, I can't remember what order I went in now, so I'm just going to go down. Dr. Paling. Paling, no. Dr. Sanchez. Sanchez, yes. Dr. Talbot. Talbot, no. Dr. Alt. Alt, yes. Ms. Bata. No conflict. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, we will let the conflict from the last um, vote stand. Uh, Ms. Bata. Bata, yes. Dr. Bell. Bell, yes. Dr. Brooks. Dr. Brooks, yes. Dr. Chen. Chen, yes. Dr. Sineas? Sineas, yes. Dr. Daly? Daly, yes. Dr. Cotton? Cotton, yes. Dr. Lair? Lair, yes. Dr. Long? Long, yes. <clears throat> and uh, Lee, no. So again, 11 to 4, the Ebola vaccine vote number two passes. Um, uh, thank you very much, everybody, for your patience with the nine votes today. Um, I believe we've had a robust discussion, but I want to make sure that if any members wish to comment on their votes, that they have the opportunity to do so. Um, I see Dr. Talbot has raised her hand, and you can comment on any of the nine votes, <laughs> but not all I of them. Have two. <laughs> yeah, I won't. I just want to comment. <laughs> I have two brief comments. The first one is, I feel like people should um, have the option of receiving the Ebola vaccine. I voted no, not because I didn't feel like they should, but because I really felt like it should be cleared, shared clinical decision making. That's hard to say after a long day. Um, and then I wanted to make a brief comment about the hepatitis vaccine in the ages. For so long, the focus of immunization programs has been on the pediatric population, and that is rightly so. This work has led to a strong infrastructure to implement widespread and efficient vaccination processes integrated into the room routine care at pediatricians' offices. This has dramatically reduced the morbidity from vaccine-preventable diseases among our children. And this is a blessing because one of my favorite sayings is, vaccines causes adults. I think the discussion and others that we have recently had on ACIP illustrate that we really need to have a frame shift and re-examination of our approach to adult and older adult immunization. As we now have more immunization options for adults, especially older adults, we need to re-examine the approach to immunizations in this population in a way that takes into account the unique aspects of adult primary care practices the presence of multiple comorbidities and immune senescence. And this is just a reminder, adults are not big kids. Well, some are, but not all. Um, and so to this end, I'd like to advocate for and will personally commit to work with ACIP leadership to strategically assess, assess how we can achieve that goal and improve the adult immunization program. And if it was half as successful as the child and pediatric program, I would be ecstatic, but um, it would be great if it could be just as good. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Talbot. Dr. Chen? Yeah, I thought I would just comment on, on two different aspects of our meeting today. One is that we increasingly more and more have to address global health uh, pathogens. So, you know, when we talk about Ebola and smallpox, you know, we, we believe that they're not really here in the U.S., but they are global health pathogens um, from history or from present right now, and that, again, will continue to um, threaten mankind. And, um, you know, when we talk about hepatitis B, you know, we have to acknowledge that there are, I, I think the projection is 300 million chronic hepatitis B cases all throughout the world. And, uh, you know, 1.5 million new or acute infections per year. So it's a global health uh, problem. And so, again, you know, our committee is being asked to, to address global health. So, you know, something that I'm passionate about. The other aspect is that um, we uh, address uh, an immunization schedule. And, and looking at that, you know, it, it was the orchestration of so many different instruments, these tools that we have, these vaccines, and trying to put them together in, into a, a, a way that makes sense for, the, for providers to be able to use. And putting those schedules together was, was, um, is a key part. And, and just seeing how that worked, I, I think it was probably a tremendous amount of work uh, putting that together. So thank you to the work group for that. But I think, again, that's, that's just what I wanted to highlight today. Um, I, I think the discussions that we had um, Again, I look forward to having ongoing discussions with all of our future vaccines, so thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Dr. Paling? I wanted to make two comments. First of all, thanks to everyone for a very wonderful meeting and robust discussion. I voted no for Ebola, recognizing it is an important um, pathogen globally, but I feel strongly that people should have a choice, and so shared this clinical decision-making was the approach that I thought was, um, was my preferred approach. The second point is, as you look at the immunization schedule for adults, it's complicated. And that's good. There's a lot of vaccines. And so it is now the time to create a universal vaccine registry for adults, because that is going to be an essential component. You have to know which vaccines people have had and so I want to strongly encourage us to do that, maybe even not by state, but even combining across states. So how do we figure this out and to really move forward and meet the opportunities? With that, I'll close. Thank you, Dr. Paling. Dr. Lair? I'd like to say thank you to all of my colleagues. This was a wonderful discussion. I would have been content if the hepatitis B had not had an age restriction. I felt that it was better policy to have an age restriction, but I think that this kind of discussion shows that the ACIP can be a very transparent and open body, and I look forward to working with you over the next four years. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I just wanted to provide comment on my hepatitis B vote. I um, was swayed by the resource um, use uh, domain in particular, and uh, I... Um, you know, we in many ways are underfunded for our immunization efforts. And so being able to make sure that we can efficiently use those efforts, to me, is something that uh, we can and should do. The other component I wanted to just articulate was that I uh, feel like it came down to values to a certain extent at the end of the day, which is the value of preventing an acute infection versus the value of preventing um, chronic liver disease or death due to hepatitis B infection. Um, and so for me, that older age population um, was tougher. But I also am uh, reassured by the fact that anyone can, who wishes to get a vaccine can receive that vaccine. So I hope that we will continue to uh, focus efforts on this. You know, I do believe, you know, expansion uh, uh, may be possible. And I, and I absolutely believe our decision making is dynamic and not fixed in time. So we always need to reevaluate. Uh, what makes sense for the U.S. population. Um, next, I see one more hand raised, Ms. McNally. Thank you. I wanted to comment that I also agreed with the Ebola vaccination recommendation, but hoped it would be under shared clinical decision making. I want to thank the CDC and providers who do vaccinate and their continued efforts on patient education, as it's so critically important that patients 
both the risks and the benefits. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McNally. Dr. Long. Yes, I'd just like to say because of the way the um, the maize and shoulds came along with the age recommendations for hepatitis B, it would certainly be in the purview of the practitioner, such as a Dr. Goldman, who has a patient population that uh, has risk uh, above the age of 60 that may be out of proportion to others to be a strong advocate. So that's certainly within the spirit of the recommendations. So in fact, doctors who would think that their patients would especially benefit from this, certainly would have the ability to be an advocate for that vaccine for those people. It, does anybody disagree with that interpretation of the recommendation? I hear no objections, Dr. Long. <laughs> um, did you wish to say anything else? No. Thank you, Dr. Long. Uh, and Dr. Cotton. I just wanted to thank all the hardworking people at the CDC who did so much work getting us to this point. And this has been a very uh, exciting several weeks of meetings with the last, last meeting and this meeting. Um, I, as a clinician in the field who has seen a tremendous amount of hepatitis B, zoster, pneumococcal disease, et cetera, it is so exciting to see these expanded indications for vaccines, and I really hope to see a lot less hepatitis B, pneumococcal disease, zoster, and then to never see things like um, smallpox or Ebola that could be vaccine prevented. So thank you very much. This is a very, very exciting uh, time, especially for adults, as mentioned by Dr. Talbot. That's all. Thank you so much, Dr. Cotton. Um, and with that, I do not see any additional hands raised. Um, so I want to take a moment to thank our speakers, our ACIP and CDC workgroup leads, our members, our liaisons, everyone for the incredibly robust discussion today. I think um, uh, I agree completely that our CDC staff um, and the workgroups do a tremendous amount of work to get it to this point so that we can make a decision, and we are extremely grateful for all the efforts that you have put in. Um, any urgent um, business or any objections to adjourning the meeting today? Oh, I see no hands raised. Okay, so I now would like to declare that today's, oh, one more announcement. Sorry, go no, ahead. I just wanted to say thank you to the committee for uh, really being able to focus uh, through all of this uh, very intense work after a full day yesterday. So thank you all so much. And hopefully it'll be a while before we meet again, but you know, I don't know. <laughs> At least a few weeks, right, Dr. Wharton? Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so uh, today's ACIP meeting is now adjourned. Thank you, everyone.